is Meghan Markle a real feminist? That is a fantastic question to ask because Meghan Markle very much portrays herself as this bastion of feminism. She is trying to create equity all across the social ladder. She's trying to build communities. And yet, oh, yet, her sole reason for the position, the sole reason that anybody cares really about what Meghan Markle says is purely for one reason, her marriage to her husband, Prince Harry. Without him, yes, Meghan would have somewhat of a new platform because of the success of Suits, but really she would be nowhere without the titles and the accolades and the legacy of her husband's family, yet she refuses to acknowledge that. And then she goes on this recent panel on International Women's Day talking about women uplifting women while she allegedly bullied her own staff members, mostly the female staff members especially. And she also refused to say anything about the online abuse being directed at her sister-in-law, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, or even her own supporters who can often be quite nasty on social media as well. I think Megan's feminism, it's not about women protecting women or women uplifting women. It's about the rest of the world and women especially uplifting Meghan Markle. Everything she does is to serve Meghan Markle and no other person. She even complains about how she was treated when she was pregnant with Archie and Lilibet, which were a couple of years ago, and yet things are going on right now within her own family or her husband's extended family, and she won't say anything about it because the truth is everything Megan does must serve only Megan. And we even see this with Harry being forced to attend this event for no other reason than to clap at her one hour presentation where she talked a very minimal amount of time, although we will exactly calculate it. So we are going to talk about this today because I think it's very important to be clear about what people's intentions actually are because people say things and then they don't really have any intention of backing them up. And in fact, they have an entirely different agenda in the first place. But if you guys haven't been to Royal News Network before, my name is Brittany and I provide compelling royal commentary about the latest news, sometimes a bit of the drama going on behind the scenes. So if you guys want to hit that subscribe button, that would be fantastic. We are gearing up towards 150,000 subscribers, which is amazing. I can't wait. And so I'm so excited this channel just hit the two year mark and I have been thrilled to see how well it has grown and I can't wait for you guys to come back. I also have an upcoming trip with members to Scotland. So if you want to check that out, there'll be a link down below. And I also have a deal with Anna Lucia Diamonds. So if you guys love lab created diamonds and just especially some gorgeous pieces, I have some earrings here. I have a ring. And so guys, all this stuff will be linked in the description box down below. And if you use code Royal 20, you will save 20%. Okay, guys. So we will start off on this. I will have to put on headphones to listen. But as we go through, we'll stop, we'll discuss. We'll actually start off with the intros, which wasn't included in the actual YouTube upload because there are some gems there as well. Because Meghan Markle, of course, thinks very, very highly of herself. And you see that in her own intro. When compared to somebody like Brooke Shields and Katie Couric, pioneers in their field who have been massively, massively successful. And yet Meghan Markle has to list all these faux achievements of herself and really, again, not acknowledging the fact that she really is a bit player in the grand scheme of things. She's accomplished very little besides marrying a man. That is her great accomplishment. Okay, so let's get into it. So to present and introduce our amazing panel today, I want to bring to the stage Shauna Nepp of the Archwell Foundation and Emily Ramshaw of the 19th. So it'd be interesting to know how long Shauna has been there, because obviously we've had a very, very high revolving door of Archwell employees. So she is co-executive director with James Holt. So it'd be interesting to know how the division of labor is between them, or if she's there just to support Megan and he's there just to support Harry. I don't know. At the Archwell Foundation, we believe in the power of community, Except if it's your family. If it's your family, then they can go screw themselves. But if it's a community of people that can maybe give them attention, then they care. As a transformative solution for our collective well-being, this is especially true for women and for mothers. Creating more equitable and accessible communities 
amongst us is the bedrock for the more inclusive and compassionate society that we all wish to see. And again, the compassion only extends to other people. It does not, in Harry and Meghan's world, extend to family. Compassion is something that they just don't really seem to exude to anybody else but themselves. Represented communities in our coverage and in our audiences. Today, we are gathered to take stock of where our respective industries stand on representation of women, particularly women of color, the potential solutions that can help women and families on and off the screen. Okay, this is weird because I keep hearing a buzz and I don't know if it's my recording or if Shauna, because it looks like she's using a little iPad, it's getting constant updates, maybe from Megan. <laughs> Megan's just texting her constantly, going, "You need to do this. You need to do that." Because I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not my thing. It's, it's her thing on the podium. So that is really, really funny. A feminist and champion of human rights and gender equity. Except if it's the Baca people from Africa, then she doesn't really care. Again, this whole thing about feminism, compassion, and all this stuff they're trying to push regarding Meghan Markle's image, it just rings false because charity starts at home. Meghan Markle can't seem to be charitable at home. So how do you expect her to really be charitable anywhere else. She has a large extended family thanks to her husband, and she has her own large extended family, but she doesn't talk to them. She doesn't seem to care about them. And so all this kind of ridiculous rhetoric that she has her team use does just doesn't work with people. And this is a problem that Megan has to figure out how to deal with. Megan, the Duchess of Sussex, is a New York Times bestselling author and co-founder of the Archwell Foundation and Archwell Productions. <laughs> New York Times bestselling author. Oh, give me a break. I got her book for five bucks from TJ Maxx, The Bench, which was awful. Like the artwork is beautiful, but I, a no child is going to read that book. And so if she's thinking that a child is going to enjoy that book, then I question how much time she spends with her children. And again, not saying that she doesn't, but there always seems to be a disconnect between Harry and Meghan and their kids. So it's just kind of interesting. Her influence extends across various sectors from entertainment to philanthropy, making her a driving force for positive change. No, she's not. She's not a driving force for positive change. She has driven toxicity in the royal sphere. I've watched royals for years. Meghan Markle, by far, bar none, introduced more toxicity into that space than anybody else. Anybody else. And it is really a driver of her. She is the one responsible for this in so many ways. And she is not this icon of feminism and she's barely produced anything. Again, Meghan Markle would be so much better served if she could figure out how to just distance herself or make herself her her things just a bit more palatable. Because again, she's so consumed with pro promoting herself that she just can't really seem to do much else. She can't seem to be realistic about the realities of her position. All right, this is a fun one for me. Katie Couric is an award-winning journalist, best-selling author, founder of Stand Up to Cancer, and co-founder of- You gotta wonder, is the crowd reaction a little bit the same, or maybe it's at least about the same, if not maybe slightly more, although I think Megan got the most, but Katie Couric's getting a pretty good crowd reaction here. And of course she should. She's Katie Couric. Katie Couric Media. Katie's extensive career spans journalism, cancer advocacy, documentaries, and scripted projects that focus on addressing important social issues like gender equality and gun violence. And you'll see there, Megan, of course, touches Katie because Megan has to touch everyone. It's a way to force intimacy. It's a way for her to, because she is a very, very clingy person. So she, if you are a friend of hers or if you randomly interact with her, she will try to touch you to just sort of calm you and just insert herself into your life. I just find that very off-putting personally. With a career that began in childhood and continues to thrive across multiple industries, Brooke Shields is not only an iconic actor, but also an advocate for women's wellness and empowerment as evidenced by her latest entrepreneurial endeavor. Beginning is now. Please welcome Brooke Shields. <laughs> So curious, guys, what do you think of Brooke's reaction to? I was just curious about the crowd reactions because obviously these are the big three right here. Megan, Katie, and Brooke. Not least, Nan Ooh, and Brooke Shields is tall compared to everyone, <laughs> which I it shouldn't be a surprise, but I didn't really get to watch this. I kind of listened to it in the car, and, which was very aggravating in some ways, and it just dragged. So we will see how far we get through this. Welcome to Nancy. Nancy. 
I mean, she got a pretty good intro too, but you can tell this, this whole panel is very much pushing a particular agenda and you might agree with it. You might disagree with it, but it is very divisive. I think because people either love it or they hate the ideas that are being promoted here. So it is interesting again, that Megan wants herself to be seen as this change and innovator, but in reality, it's really Catherine because Catherine is the one who I think can bring people of all sides together because she's not trying to be divisive. Whereas Megan is trying to be divisive, trying to promote certain political beliefs and ideologies. Okay, guys, so now we're going to be switching to a different video because I had recorded this whole thing, but I did have a couple of interruptions because it was on my phone and they do actually have the whole thing on YouTube. So I think that's helpful. And so we'll just go with that one. And then also as well, guys, I will be increasing the speed because that helps a bit because of what I need to do. I think I can increase the speed. Please tell me I can increase the speed. Otherwise, we're, oh yes, playback speed. Let's go. 1.5. Why? Because it's faster and we will all be so much better served if it goes faster. Let's be honest. <laughs> but also because to you guys, if you don't know uh, what I do is I try to s keep all my clips to about 15 seconds. And so because of that, I need to be careful because otherwise you get copyright strikes and those sorts of things. So we'll be keeping everything to about 15 seconds. You might see sometimes as I go through this, the things get shortened or truncated. And that's again, just to abide by that 15 second rule. So let's get into it. Are you excited? I'm not. <laughs> to be honest. And again, the title of this panel is Breaking Barriers, Shaping Narratives, How Women Lead On and Off the Screen. And we do sort of get this answered, sort of not. And oh, there will be some cringe moments ahead. So let's get going, guys. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go. Entertainment or the movies, women's representation still falls short, particularly for women of color and for mothers. I don't totally agree with this idea that women's reputation and media falls short. I just don't think that's true. And we've seen in the last couple of months, you could say two big superhero movies that were entirely women led and failed massively. Obviously, we're talking about the Marvels and Madam Web. I don't even think the Marvels hit 200 million, where if you know anything about Disney movies, like the first one hit a billion. And if this one can't even hit 200 million, that's really, really bad. I don't even know if Madam Web hit 100 million. And at least for the Marvels, the budget was supposedly 200 plus million, 300. So they definitely lost a lot of money on that movie. So female led doesn't necessarily mean money in the bank. Because Everything in terms of entertainment, and I just want to say this as a front load right now, stories matter. You can have anybody in that title role. If the character is good, nobody's going to care if they're a man or a woman. You have to create good characters. And this notion that if you just stick a female in there and that'll be fine, like the Indiana Jones, they tried to make it move it towards female led it bombed and this is happening across hollywood mostly to pretty bad results and that's because you don't put a character and pigeonhole her into the role of a man you need to have good characters create movies around female characters like barbie and they'll do really really well but trying to take let's say a role or a franchise that's mostly led and consumed by men and trying to pigeonhole women into it generally doesn't work too well. But again, this is a Hollywood echo chamber in here. And you'll see this throughout this. This is very much an industry echo chamber at this event. So, okay, let's get right into it. I want to start with you, Megan. Yesterday, the Gina Davis Institute and the advocacy organization Moms First reached a re released a report that your foundation, R12, supported examining the cultural portrayals of motherhood in television. Can you tell us about why this project interested you and what the study found? Okay, so I have a whole video I did on this, which I will edit and upload after this one. I found that the project was, and the research results ended up being very, very shallow. So, but let's hear what Megan has to say. You guys will tell me if this is a good volume then. Yes? Okay. <laughs> um, I found that so cringy. I found that so incredibly cringy. Is this a volume good? Uh, okay. So, yeah, I just found that really, really odd first of all because nobody else did it even the professionals like katie kirk just picked up her mic and went I, I don't think megan really had to adjust her volume that's just really really odd um well thank you and i'm just firstly i'm so excited to be here and to be with such incredible women so much brilliance on this panel and a, just an amazing way to celebrate international women's day so thank you all for coming to to listen um yeah so yeah i mean not great not 
as you're saying, the Gina Davis Institute and Moms First released this report, and my husband and I, our foundation, the Archwell Foundation, helped to fund it. Because I think from our standpoint, and certainly from mine, there are three key reasons why it felt vital to see the information they were going to be pulling through this report. So on a so Megan, again, it's all about representing her and herself. And you'll see this here in her answer. Personal level. So I was really curious to see what the report was going to uncover in terms of oftentimes as women, you may agree with this, the way that we see ourselves is reflected back to us, sometimes accurately and sometimes much to our disservice, inaccurately in what we see in media. And this is true for men and women. It's not just a women issue. It's a men issue too. Because when it comes to fathers in television shows, oftentimes they're kind of portrayed as the bumbling fool. And yes, there's some truth in that. There's some in truth in that. But I think Megan, again, all of, everything she does is centered around women, women, women. I don't think, I feel sorry for Archie, to be quite honest. And Harry too. Harry is an afterthought. This is all about, you know, it's important for women, 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 mother, mother, mother. Again, very little attention given to fathers. And so to be able to have the findings to uncover what we can do to propel that, to make sure women are really feeling seen in a way that is reflective of who and how we are and how we move through the world felt important. Um, from a And I don't always like the notion that whatever you're producing must reflect real life, which I feel like Megan was trying to promote there. What you're doing does not need to reflect real life all the time. Hollywood and television shows and movies are supposed to be entertainment and they're supposed to be distracting. They're not supposed to be a representative of your real life. If you want that, that's a reality TV show or you can actually live your life. Philanthropic standpoint with our foundation, there's obviously a lot of work to be done in terms of supporting women and moms. You can begin with paid leave. And, Hello. Uh, um, you know, and just really looking at one of the findings actually said that working moms are paid 62 cents to the dollar for what working dads are. And I don't know about that statistic necessarily because I know sometimes those are vastly overinflated. But when it comes to her portrayals of mom, what did she say again? Paid leave. And Hello. Uh, you know, when it comes to her paid leave issue, that's not necessarily a totally bad issue, but it's definitely very much a political one. And you're reminded, too, this is a woman who also took six months off in the middle after signing a mega deal with Netflix because she needed maternity leave. Even though maternity leave is for women who have no help outside the home, like a housekeeper, nannies, somebody to do perhaps even cooking for them, driving them around. Megan has all those things. So her emphasis on paid leave doesn't really understand the dynamics of what it actually means to be a working mom in many ways. And also as well, again, it's a budget thing with businesses. I understand both sides of it. Yes, you need more time off, but also too, businesses need to function. And Harry and Megan, of course, they're not business people. They don't understand. That. And it's almost feeling punitive at a certain point when you're a mom and you're juggling so much and caring so much and you want to be supported in the best way possible. So it's those reasons that you know, we have a production company and as we build out our slate and have projects that we're doing or with podcasting as well to ensure that we are responsibly filling in the roles of moms and women to be reflected in a way that's accurate. So this again, no mention of men. It's all about women. Harry must be there so she can talk about women and mothers, but she doesn't really seem to care how men are portrayed in media. Again, it's interesting. Report, I think, is, is really valuable and just proud we could support it. Again, I think the report is actually kind of terrible. And again, there's some of their suggestions include that they need to show moms on television with their roots showing that moms should be fat on television and that they should have messy homes. That's literally the suggestion. Moms are represented as thin, young, white, and not really working outside of the home, which is a patriarchal fantasy, right? This is not our real lives. And it erases a lot of women are stay at home moms. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Yes, not all of them are, but I think, again, the emphasis is on their ideology, what they want to see rather than what's really reflected everywhere. So again, it's just something interesting to consider. And I remember when I was in grad school, that's when I had my first baby. And I found it harder to secure affordable and good quality, high quality childcare than to actually complete my PhD. Wow. That was because caring for children is much different than a PhD. I don't understand quite why I need to explain that. But in general, if you're asking somebody to care for your child, that is a huge responsibility. Doing research for a paper, not the same thing. Not the same thing. So again, so at least some other perspective here, I feel like it's a bit skewed and a bit, I would say, narcissistic maybe, or a bit not dealing necessarily with fully reality. Because if you're a grad student, you have the benefit of being able to sort of work around your child's schedule. Yes, you need help in terms of child care at some times, but you're also able to kind of manage things, I think, a bit better than mom who has to go into work. I mean, I guess it depends on what research or PhD you're doing, because sometimes you have to do teaching assistant things and those sorts of things. But sometimes you, 
it's just research at home. It's like the hardest thing ever. And so, you know, when you're having, so in terms of societal, when you have policymakers who are not working moms for the most part, right, these are the ones that are actually determining policy. And we know that if they're not actually having contact with folks, they're deriving their ideas from television, from film, right? Just subconsciously. You know, that's not real, but that's what you're seeing. And you're seeing, oh. So this whole notion about television and the view that we see of television and entertainment is something that comes up again and something that Megan sort of pushes as well. And it's this notion that what you see on television is, Yes, it's subconscious, but they're also thinking that it really does inform your viewpoints. Don't ever use television to really inform your viewpoints. That's a bad idea. It's a bad idea because entertainment is not supposed to be real. It's entertainment. And so these stories, these events are not real. So I was like, okay, seeing this commercial for like 911, something that TV show, and there's some sort of bomb that goes off on a, or some explosion that goes off on a, on a, cruise ship and it's listing heavily to one side and i'm sitting there thinking why is they doing that there's not really a thing <laughs> but they it's over dramatized it's unrealistic it's not aspirational sometimes it is but oftentimes too it's much exaggerated than what we see in real life so if you're taking all your inclinations from television then you need to like adjust a bit but i think too because of reality TV shows and so much of our lives that have become on the screen. I think some people can't differentiate quite as much. And I think Hollywood people are probably the worst offenders there. Such a critical driver for social change. So Megan, why is this such an important factor in making the world more equitable? So again, I noticed too that they very much focus on Megan the first little bit here at the panel. And she is the least qualified out of everyone. You got a PhD, a child actress grown into a major actress, model, changed industry and then you also have a journalist who broke barriers and yet let's focus on megan markle who the feminist who got everywhere she is by marrying a man and i think we can all agree that representation matters in terms of if you're a young girl and you see yourself in a position of power or strength or leadership you can believe that that is possible if you look out on the screen or you look out in the world and you see no one that looks like you it is incomprehensible for most people to imagine that they can have that level of success or joy or strength whatever it may be i don't like that I don't like Megan saying that at all. So you can't see somebody like you on screen so you can't have joy in your life because you can't achieve X. How narrow-minded and shallow is she? Because I've always been under the belief, and granted, yes, it could be some of my background, education, how I was raised, and those sorts of things. But I've never been somebody who believes that I must see myself on screen to be able to achieve things. I achieve things because I work hard and I see something that I want and I go for it. So when it comes to, I have a master's degree in history and I have a master's degree in history because I love history. My parents, my sister, they have somewhat an interest in it, but nobody in my family really loves it as much as I do. They all probably thought I was a little bit crazy because I got really into understanding like Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and all these sorts of things. And so I begged my parents when I was in eighth grade for a Holocaust like encyclopedia, massive book that I got from Costco. And they, at first they said no. And they went back and got it for me because how many kids in eighth grade asked for a book like that? Those were the type of books I was personally reading. And I was reading it because I was really interested in it and not because I saw anybody being a historian. I probably could not name to you a single female historian but I found it interesting and I believed in myself and I didn't need to see somebody else to make me believe X was possible because I believed it because I knew I could do it. And so I find that a very shallow, very narrow minded and very, very insecure view of the world to believe that you must see yourself on screen to believe that you have a shot at doing anything is just plain silly nonsense. It's silly nonsense. You can do anything you want to do. Yes, there are opportunities that maybe you can't achieve just because you don't maybe have the personality for it. You don't have the body type for it. I can't be a Victoria's Secret supermodel. I'm not thin enough and I'm not tall enough. I'm not whining and crying over that. I just accept reality as it is. I accept reality as it is. And I admire the women who do have that because that's so cool. I wish I was taller. Like that's the one thing I really wish. I was like, oh man, if I could just be like 5'9", I'd be happy or a different shoe size because then you get great deals on on really really nice shoes because the big sizes are always on sale but i have like a seven seven and a half and everybody has those shoe sizes. so that's all to say again that what megan i think is promoting here i think is a really dangerous idea especially for young girls well you must see yourself you must see yourself on screen and something something and then you can believe 
it's achievable. I want to say to any young girl out there, you can do whatever you want to do, but it requires something that is beyond a Hollywood screen. And that's hard work. You have to work at it. It's not something that just happens because you want it to. It happens because you worked hard and you achieved it. And yes, maybe you won't get everything you want out of life and maybe you won't achieve all the things you want to. Don't be this sort of person that believes that you must have a screen show you how successful you can be. Be successful by working hard and creating something, doing something and figuring out what makes you, you could say, happy or fulfilled and Continue to do that and achieve that because that is what will bring real success. A person on the screen will not bring you success. You know, the key thing that I think needs to be focused on in terms of equity is that it's not a zero sum game. Just because someone else has the same advantage that you do doesn't mean that you're losing anything. And it actually creates an environment that is so fair, but also inclusive where people feel as though they have a seat at the table as they should. So this is, again, another, I would say, more progressive talking point, this idea of equity. Equity means that you have equality of outcome. So if everybody starts a YouTube channel, in theory, they should all be successful as I am or Mr. Beast or something like that. That's not true. That's not possible. Just because you have the opportunity does not mean you have an equal outcome. What equality means is that we all have the opportunity, but we are not all guaranteed the same outcome. And what Megan's saying too is also a bit dangerous is that the affirmative action, which she is sort of referencing here, if you don't know, affirmative action is the notion that college campuses must have a meet a certain number of racial diversity. And what this results in is particularly Asian students being excluded from Harvard, Yale, Brown, the higher levels of institution because they tend to score higher. And people who fit in other categories who score lower get in instead because they must reach some sort of racial parity, which is what Megan's talking about, which in essence does mean that somebody gets their spot removed because somebody else gets elevated unfairly. That's what equity results in. An interesting story just to put this into perspective, I had somebody whose son was trying to get into medical school. And although his grades and his test scores were exceptionally high, he was denied because he was white and another student got in instead of him. And they had to have that student take remedial courses to get up to par. So what equity means is that somebody might be denied because they're looking at different factors in order to determine who is successful. So that is what Megan is denying here or ignoring. And just to follow up too, when it comes to equity as well, this is a woman who has a royal title, whose children, she insists, also have royal titles. And so her idea of equity, royalty at its very foundation, is not equitable. It's a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy. So excuse me, Megan Markle, like seriously right now? Seriously? You're talking about equity with a royal title, making people call you the Duchess of Sussex? Also, I want to mention as well that she didn't make anybody call her ma'am. I guess that went down very poorly when it was revealed that the Invictus Games, the president was told to call them Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. And then after that, he could call them sir or ma'am. I guess that's dead if you're Katie Couric or Brooke Shields. I guess you don't have to do that. So again, Meghan Markle is very elitist talking about equity. Megan, will you tell the story about when you wrote that letter to PNG? Because I don't know if anyone is, if everyone's heard it, but it's such a great story at a very young age, what you did. That's so funny. Oh, gosh. Katie Couric. Oh, Katie Couric. Katie Couric, I think in this really was out of touch. She mentioned that most young people are on Facebook and Instagram. And I'm like, Katie, they're all moving to TikTok. They're all on TikTok. They're not on Instagram anymore. I know Instagram is skewing older. Facebook started young and it is also skewed a lot older. Instagram is following the same track. And so when Katie said that, I was like, Katie Couric, come on now. And now we have this. We all know the stupid story, Katie Couric. We all know this stupid story, but Megan was thrilled as punch to repeat it for the 12,000th time. Um, yes, I, I was disrupted the flow. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, but go ahead. She is so thrilled, guys. She is so thrilled to talk about this story. I was uh, 11 years old, about 11 years old, and I'd seen a commercial on TV um, for a dishwashing liquid. And the boys in my class at the time said, you know, it's women all over America fighting greasy pots and pans. And the boys said, yeah, that's where women belong in the kitchen. And Okay, they're children, Megan Markle. They are children. 
And not to mention the fact that why were you watching commercials in school? <laughs> why were you watching commercials in school? I don't remember really watching television with commercials in school. Like they would show us videos from time to time, but not something where you would have a commercial interrupting. So clearly this was something purposely put on by the teacher. And at many have reported, though I haven't been able to see something conclusively, that this was a class project. This was a class project. And so Meghan Markle is participating in a class project. In addition to that, herself did not change this. Her belief, her delusional belief that she herself, only Meghan, changed this multi-million dollar ad campaign is delusional. And at 11, I just found that infuriating and wrote lots of letters and put pen to paper and they ended up changing the commercial um, to people all over America. And, you know, that's it's, it's funny to look back at it now because that was before social media where you had a reach that was so much greater. It was just an 11. It was just an 11 year old. I was just an 11 year old making an impact. You were not Megan Markle. You were one child, I'm sure, in perhaps thousands, if not millions of people writing campaigns about this. And so this idea, again, that she clings to this story so desperately, desperately clings to this story, just tells me that she really is quite delusional when it comes to this, that she truly believes that this story is real. It's, it's like believing in Santa Claus at her adult age. She should know. She should have the common sense to know that this story is entirely must have been fabricated by her father to make her happy. The, she, I mean, there's just no other way that a single child, a no-name child, changed diddly squat. I'm sorry. And PNG has never said, oh, yes, Meghan Markle, we remember her letter. We have it enshrined in PNG. No, they don't remember it. They don't know about it. They haven't even talked about whatever the campaign was that got it to change. And I'm sure because they had a relationship, if they had something that said, oh, yes, Meghan Markle achieved X, they would show it to us. But that they have it means they don't really have it. So again. Very interesting to see Megan once again touting this great success of her life when it really isn't that. 11-year-old with a pen and paper, but it just, I guess, goes to show that if you know that there's something wrong and you're using your voice to advocate in the direction of what is right, that can really land and resonate and make huge change for a lot of people. So your voice is um, not small. It just needs to be heard. But again, this story is a fabrication. It's a fabrication. It's fake. But I think Megan shares it all the time because I think she wants people to see it as this huge groundbreaking achievement. and. I don't think anybody is grasping onto that very much. And I think she's constantly retelling it over and over and over again, just in the desperate vain hope that somebody finally sees it for this massive achievement that it is. And Brooke Shields response here, I, was, I wasn't all that impressed with Brooke Shields on this particular panel, but this is funny. This is one of the ways we'll be different. When I was 11, I was playing a prostitute. <laughs> so, okay, Brooke. I, okay. I, I gotta say that was pretty good, <laughs> but it was also sort of awkward and also too it's like you got to know like come on ladies you all know that this is not true <laughs> you got to know right you all got to have some common sense here but whatever only 30 featured female identified lead or co-lead actors that's a number that hasn't been that low since the mid 2010s what's behind that regressive trend it's called the strikes and covid that's not that hard guys it's not that hard it's not that groundbreaking they had to make choices based on what is successful and if a female lead in a particular franchise is not successful, they won't do it. Again, this, this disconnect between what you want and the dollars and cents is huge. It's a business, guys. It's not a advocacy thing. Entertainment should be a business. It should be seen as a business. Yes, there is art attached, but it's a business, guys. But um, there's this really disturbing study that came out of the UK that Gen Z boys and men actually are more likely than boomers to believe that feminism does more harm than good. I think she's mentioning that study. And I think that is interesting to consider. But you got to wonder, too, where has feminism gone? It's gone from being we want the genders to be treated equally to destroying men in order to elevate women. So those are two different things. So if you're looking from a young man's perspective and you love the Marvel films because they're, they're led by men. And then all of a sudden they're shoving women and making women more powerful than men in these shows. And you know, just for, from a physicality point of view, that there's no way a woman can beat a man. Then that will develop into some negative reactions. Again, their, their disconnect between cause and effect here is very evident. Pretty Baby, the documentary about your life came out on Hulu last year. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it does I saw part of that at the gym and it looked, it looked pretty good. It looked pretty interesting. So I was reading the subtitles as I was working out. We started talking about the sexualization of young women, especially in our country. And I was at the center of it. I was, and I was promoting it and I was doing it. And I was lucky 
because I was surrounded by a very... This is a very important topic. I think Brooke Shields is a very good person to discuss this in terms of what happened to her as she was growing up in the entertainment industry and being a sex symbol very, very young. I think this is an important topic, especially on social media and the sexualization of young women and them feeling inadequate because they don't feel like they measure up in those sorts of things. So that I think that is an interesting, much inter more interesting topic to discuss the Megan stuff. It's not that different than it is now, but what I'm noticing is that there are more voices who are surrounded by other women and other supportive voices. And together as a collective, we can move it forward and not, it be, have it not be angry, but have it be progressive. One of the things I do want to mention here is that Hollywood, all of Hollywood was well aware of Harvey Weinstein. They were aware of him for years and yet Meryl Streep still called him God. So Hollywood is the worst offender here. Hollywood is an industry full of cesspools. And because of that, again, they, they are trying to say that they are progressive and that they are changing the world. No, they're not. They are the worst offenders of it. Like the worst offenders in terms of exploitation and everything is Hollywood a thousand, a thousand percent. The dynamics of the show, the division of labor, who was doing presidential interviews. I knew little girls were watching that, getting ready for school uh, with their moms. And I wanted them to say, look, she is just as good as he is. I do kind of like that from Katie Couric, especially when it comes to interviewing people. I think she talked to earlier about too, because I have to cut out a lot of this stuff, talking about how she wanted to make sure that, that it was equal between them during like celebrity interviews versus hard cutting more political interviews, perhaps like she didn't want to always be the cooking segment or interviewing the entertainer. She wanted to have equal opportunities to do more of the journalistic things, which I think is great. I looked at a picture of all the heads of the stream, major streamers, and it's five white guys. So we, we have. Okay. I just hate the thing of the, oh, it's five white guys. Isn't that terrible? It's like, well, they got into that position for a reason. It might not be because of their skin color or their gender. They might just be the most qualified to that ever occur to anybody. And just because you put a woman in there does not mean it makes it better. You can even look at something like Kathleen Kennedy in Star Wars. That has been an epic train wreck by every stretch of the imagination. Just because she's a woman doesn't make it more successful. I just hate that that mindset. I just don't like that mindset. That just because it's a woman, it, it's better. That's just not true. That's not always true. Competency matters. Who who cares what they look like? Who cares what their gender, race, anything like that is? Are they good at their job? If they're good at their job, let them do their job. That's all that matters. And when it comes to podcasting, women are 50% of listeners, but men are 79% of hosts. Okay, again, why why does that matter? So women enjoy listening to men? Is that a problem? I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. But again, I I don't understand. I don't understand just the, the fuss that people make over the some of the most ridiculous things sometimes. People who grow up in rural areas, people from the middle of the country. And I think that would even add to the representation we're seeing now. I, I thought that was interesting when she talks about the middle of the country, because the problem you have with especially the crowds in Los Angeles and New York is that they think the rest of the country is fly over country. They, they don't care about people in the Midwest, South, anything like that, because they have literally no clue how any of those people live. You find that Hollywood people who get out of the bubble and live in some of these different places tend to get a little bit more grounded or be more grounded because they're dealing with real folks. But the crowds that live exclusively in Los Angeles or New York City tend to not be that way because they, they live in a bubble and in a in an echo chamber bubble where everything is repeated at them all the time. Find and, and ferret out the filmmakers who appreciate a woman over 40. I mean, I'm 58, but, but, but appreciate the experience, the life experience, the we've raised the children, we've had the families, we've had business. So I do think this is an interesting point. And I do think this is something that a lot of actresses struggle with. But I do think too, it's sort of the thing that happens is I think as you age within the Hollywood system, the better actress you must be to be successful. You just need to be a really good actress and then you can, can continue on. But the other thing too, is I don't think Brooke mentioned here is that if you can't find what you want in terms of scripts or something like that, then try to work on your own. That's the thing too. Sometimes I feel like Hollywood people just are waiting for somebody else to be the, the grand the grand person who had the grand gesture or the grand vision or whatever. And it's like, well, be your own vision, be your own. That's why I started this channel. I was like, well, I don't see everything I want on other people's channels in terms of royal coverage. So I'll just make my own. And that's what I did. People are feeling more ageless now, but you're right. There's still a stigma in terms of the industry on pigeonholing where you can be. Yes. As opposed to seeing us as, I mean, the depth of knowledge and experience, as you're saying, Brooke, there's just so much richness that can be given to roles when you have an actor who can bring that level of experience. But it's not life experience. It's acting. Again, this disconnect between the reality of 
being an actor and just having life experience. Yes, life experience does give you more depth as an actor, but that doesn't necessarily make you a better actor. <laughs> I don't know why I'm I'm not in, I'm not in the entertainment industry and somehow I feel like I know this and they don't. Acting at the end of the day is acting. You need to be a good actor. It doesn't matter how much life experience you have. Some of those people in Hollywood don't have a ton of education. Like some of them dropped out in like middle school, high school to pursue acting. And yes, guess why they're successful? They're good actors. It's not necessarily because they have life experience. They're good actors. You have to have good actors, good scripts. It's not just because you're old and you have life experience. That doesn't make you a good actor. It just doesn't. It just like. I don't understand why they think this because it's just simply not true. A good actor is a good actor regardless of age, regardless of life experience. If you are good, you are good. If you're not good, having some more life experience, it may help or you may just still be the same crummy actor you were to begin with. And you still might not be getting roles because again, the older you get, especially I think for women, and this might be a, issue and you can say that's true but the older you get the better you have to be and so if you're just saying well i i raised children now I'm, i have more life experience but you're still the same actor you were when you were 23 that ain't just gonna cut it anymore yay for the small independent studios like a24 right as well as international yeah we love a24 right <laughs> and those are actually the the studios that are driving the the more diverse leads it's not actually the legacy big studios well the thing too is money are those little productions making money? Because what's interesting too about what she ends up talking about is considering the movie, I think it was called Bros, and it was had two gay leads and it was a big budget gay romantic comedy, but it bombed pretty badly. And that was because there just wasn't a huge audience for it. And so I think, again, too, you see the echo chamber here. We want all this representation stuff, but are people going to see it? That's the question. Just because you like this particular thing doesn't mean people are going to see it. And that could be including anybody across the spectrum. You need to get butts in seats because this is not just about representation. It's about dollars and cents, guys. You need to be making money. And again, maybe this is why Harry and Meghan can't seem to make any money with their productions. So yes, I think it's great that we're finally approaching par population parity. But in terms of long term, we need to see more people jumping in. And there's money to be made and there's awards to be won, right? It's like, why wouldn't you do it? No, there's not. There is not money to be made everywhere in this instance. There's just not. You again, you can't just pigeonhole diversity into something and expect it to be successful. Crazy Rich Asians was successful because it was a good story and a good movie. That's why it didn't have anything to do with, at the end of the day, the Asian leads. That was just a byproduct of a, the good story that was there. And so again, these people don't know how to make money in the real world. They they see the entertainment aspect of it. They don't see how the decisions that they're making impact box office because at the end of the day, box office is king. You can do all this diversity DEI stuff all you want, but at some point, like Disney is finding out, you may run your company into the ground because guess what? The audience checks out. A feminist, well-known feminist who shall not be named said, um, I couldn't really folk evaluate her performance because her makeup was so bad. Okay. I have to say, as I was watching this video again, I really want to change up Katie Kirk's eye makeup because she does that thing where she lines the whole bottom of her eye, which I don't do because I have small eyes. And the best thing to do is actually do it halfway because it opens up your eyes more. And so I, I just look at Katie and I just want to adjust that a smidge. <laughs> is that bad? <laughs> is that bad of me? I don't know if I can do this anymore. And she goes, Mom, remember what Samantha said on Sex in the City? Oh. And I was like, her 10-year-old daughter quoted Sex in the City to her. Yes, social media is a environment that I think has a lot of that. You know, it's really interesting as I can reflect on it. I keep my distance from it right now, just for my own um, well-being. But she definitely loves social media, though. That's the thing. Like her whole thing about Harry was looking at his Instagram to determine if she thought he would be a good match or not. So again, she loathes social media in a way, but she loves it too. But she doesn't like people who criticize her. So the bulk of the bullying and abuse that I was experiencing in social media and online was when I was pregnant with Archie and with Lily and with a newborn with each of them. Um, and you just think about that and you it's really wrap your head around why people would be so hateful. It's not catty, it's cruel. Her fans on social media are exactly the same and she could call them out or she could call out the abuse directed at Catherine. And you think too, this is something that happened several years ago now, several years ago now, yet she's still 
harping on it because again, it's all about her. She first addresses a question broadly about women on social media by complaining about what happened to her. Now, granted, that is where the question is directed, but for a woman who's supposedly met with parents whose children have died because of social media, allegedly, then why didn't she start off with them? Because clearly their situations are worse than hers were. So why is she going down this path? And again, I think it's because Megan doesn't like the criticism. Yes, some of it goes too far. It goes 100% too far when it comes to Megan. And I call that out when I see it. But when it comes to what happens with Megan, she is just entirely focused on that. She doesn't really seem to care about anybody else's experience but her own. Why you would do that? And certainly when you're pregnant, you have a newborn. We all, as moms, you know, it's such a tender and sacred time. And I think, you know, you could either succumb to it or nearly succumb to how painful that is. And maybe in some regards, because I was pregnant, that mammalian instinct just kicked in so do everything you can to protect your child. And I, I thought that was so weird. Mammalian instinct. What? Doesn't she mean maternal instinct? Mammalian? I mean, no offense, Megan, but have you seen what mammals do to their own kid children sometimes? Like actual like animals? They are not so protective of their kids sometimes. They'll kill them. They'll abandon them. They'll 100% do that. As a result, protect yourself too. But, you know, I think as we look at what's happening in social media, there is so much work to be done in terms of keeping people safe. And that starts as we see what's happening with children um, and their exposure to things. That is a parental issue. Yes, it's, it's exceptionally hard. I'm not here telling anybody that that's easy. But the reality is when it comes to children in social media, it is a parent's responsibility to keep them protected. It's not the company's responsibility to do so because that inevitably will result in censorship on everyone everyone. And that's what she wants, censoring any anti-Megan comments. Also just creating these habits that what I find the most disturbing, frankly, especially as a supporter of women, is how much of the hate is women completely spewing that to other women. Yes. And her fans are, of course, guilty of this. I've seen other royal fans guilty of it as well. I have been on the receiving end of it. So yeah, it is definitely very, very true. But Megan, again, is avoiding any culpability in anything that has been directed towards her. Cause again, she has been publicly alleged to be a bully personally to her own female staff members, especially. Cannot make sense of that because I understand that there are certain platforms up today. She can't make sense of that. She bullied staff members. Allegedly. I have to say allegedly she bullied allegedly staff members, female staff members, and she can't understand. She can't understand it. And I, I do think too, it's, there's a difference between doing something personally and doing it online. She did it to people Personally, she devalued people, made them feel horrible personally. And it was, there was a power imbalance there too. So she's saying that she, like, there's nothing that she can do. Yeah. This is being streamed on one of those platforms. And it's also fantastic because people are going to have access to hear all of this brilliance and all of this insight. And at the same time, it's a platform that has quite a bit of hate and rhetoric and incentivizes people to create pages where they can churn out very, very inciting comments and conspiracy theories that can have a tremendously negative effect on someone's mental health. But that is the purpose of free speech. You have free speech. There are platforms on here and you can't clamp them down just to avoid your own bruised ego. I'm sure there are things said about me all the time that I would not appreciate. I know there are. I know there are. And I don't look at them though. I don't look at them. Why? Because it doesn't help for me to do so. It does not help me in the slightest to go down that rabbit trail. And that's because I still want to do my own thing. And I don't want what I see in public to impact what I'm doing here. And you can say Megan perhaps is doing the same thing, but I'm not calling for them necessarily to be torn. The other pages to be torn down because they have free speech rights. They have the right to say what they want to say, but they should not infringe on my right to say what I want to say, nor should they be, let's say, sharing personal information, taking personal pictures, which I've had experience that I find is a line. But at the same time, they do have the right to disagree with what I'm saying, just like I have the right to disagree with what they're saying. And I really don't comment on any other royal commentators, really. And I do have opinions on them, but I generally try not to share them, except for about Omid Scobie. And I did do something on Matter of Fact, because I did think it was funny that she called out Catherine and William for not working. I wonder where they are. And then like the next day or a couple hours later, Catherine was having surgery. And then she's like, people, well, don't come at me in the comments. That's just mean. I'm like, but you were being mean and snotty before. And now you're calling out other people for being snotty at you. Ugh, come on, people. Anyways. Um, their physical safety. So I think we have to really take a, a look at that. And we're talking about how many women are in leadership positions. So you're saying in broadcast, 
there are a lot of women that are at the highest level, executive level, who are great champions of women, who are great philanthropists, and they are working in these spaces, and yet they're allowing this kind of behavior to run rampant. It's called free speech, Meghan Markle. It's called free speech. You cannot eliminate any criticism towards you. That's just not how this works. It's called free speech. That is what she's antithetical to. She does not want free speech if it negatively impacts her. But that's a risk you take when you become a public figure, is that the media, the press, the public will turn on you. You can't control it. And at a certain point, they have got to put the do's behind the say's and really make some changes on a systemic level. And then, you know, on the flip side of that, we have a responsibility in all of that. The systemic. Again, she wants censorship. That's what she wants. That's what she's advocating for, is censorship of things she doesn't like. Change has to happen at the same time as the cultural change is happening. Because if you're reading something terrible, terrible about a woman, why are you sharing it with your friends? Why are you choosing to put that out in the world? Well, what is, <laughs> that's what her followers do all the time. But they, they, they mask it by saying, well, you criticize Megan, therefore we should be able to criticize you. But then they're not criticizing you. They're bullying you. Again, her disconnect between reality and fantasy is clear here. Your friend or your mom or your daughter, you wouldn't do it. And I think that is the piece that is so lost right now in what's happening in the digital space and in certain sectors of the media. We have forgotten about our humanity. She has bullied allegedly staff members, her own personal staff members, where there is a power imbalance. <laughs> Seriously. It has got to change because I understand there's a bottom line and I understand that a lot of money is being made there. But even if it's making dollars, it doesn't make sense. I feel like she was really, really proud of that moment. I really, I feel like she was really, really, and maybe that's where I got the dollar and cents thing. But my thing I feel like makes more sense because a movie needs to make dollars and cents in order for it to make sense. <laughs> Get it. <laughs> Impossible. Social media was not around when all the vitriol was being hurled at me and my mother and everything. And, and it was unbelievable. Now, and I think Brooke Shields had a much broader experience than Meghan Markle did, let alone Meghan's own sister-in-law, Catherine. Social media vitriol right now, mostly from Meghan's own supporters, by the way, and then what happened to her when she was in her early 20s? Meghan Markle has no idea. Bring up these young women who want to cancel out those mess that messaging and only go towards the positive because there's no function in the negativity. I, I think that's true. But at the same time, we're also talking about human nature. And I'm sorry, but social media is kind of like middle school in a lot of ways. <laughs> so middle school, that's like the worst age to be a young woman is middle school. And so we are all to a certain extent that little hurt middle school girl. And so I feel like that vitriol comes out on social media quite a bit. And it's just some Thing we can't totally avoid. It's just something that exists. And I think, again, they, they focus so much on eliminating that. But the reality is it will always exist. I mean, I, I really think it sort of it can piggyback on what Brooke was saying as well. But, you know, with our 12 Foundation, we work with Social Media Victims Law Center, which is very important and heartaching work, heartbreaking work. Yeah. As she spent the first bit of time talking about herself. Now, granted, yes, she was asked about herself. But if she was good or really cared about what happened to these other families, she could have turned the conversation back to yes what i experienced was bad but what happened to these families is heartbreaking it's heart-wrenching it's terrible it's horrible and bringing up some of those stories again she can't even give specifics on the stories of these families but yet i mean she was sort of vague about herself too but at the same time i think it would be more impactful to bring up what's happening to people who can appreciate what's happened to them because Meghan Markle's experience is very, very unique in a lot of ways. Parents whose children have taken their lives because of what was happening to them in the online space and um, the level of online harms that are there when you have these beautiful, vibrant children that are either being so aggressively bullied online or frankly, these young girls who are going online and you're just they're drowning in this world of comparison. Yes. And that, of course, is part of social media and Instagram. But again, it's about knowing your limits individually as a person, what you can handle, what you cannot handle. And again, it's kind of the parent's responsibility. Putting that entire burden on the company means that it'll censor things for everyone. Only their sense of self has become so small that they don't see a value in being alive. So we've worked really actively with these parents. I feel like it's more complicated than that. So I would have to, I, but it would be helpful to hear the actual stories because I would care more about those stories than Meghan Markle complaining about the online bullying she apparently received when she was pregnant with Archie and Lily. I'd, I'd be more interested in that. In their grief, but also in the interest of affecting change. I think as we're talking about all this, and yes, this is very heavy and it's weighted, but it's also really real. They are working so hard as young people who are in it saying, this isn't making sense for us. We are not just a number or a statistic and our lives matter. Our sense of self and our sense of purpose matters. There's so you have to take personal responsibility. And if you can't handle the challenges of social media, then get off social media. That's, that's the answer here. 
That's the answer here. The answer is not a decision on high. It's personal autonomy. That's what should matter, not what somebody else thinks or how the company itself should determine things. It's your personal autonomy, your personal choice. I don't want to take that away from someone, but Meghan Markle does. There's a lot of action that's happening, to your point earlier as well, working as a collective. I mean, you mentioned Gloria. Gloria Simon is one of the people that will say any sort of work that you're doing that is in the direction of good, you've got to make it fun. So even though all this is weighted, she loves working on a campaign. She loves what happens when you come together and you go, you know what, inch by inch, we're getting closer to seeing a much better place and certainly a better online world. The online world is always going to be what it's going to be. It's going to be accessible. Like, let's be honest here. Like the number one websites that are visited in the entire world are porn sites, guys. So come on, let's be real here. We all just have a responsibility there to weigh in. As moms, it is a really, when you're a new mom, it is a really vulnerable time. And the effect that social media can have on new mothers I mean, even just the lack of sleep because they spend all this time scrolling and scrolling, but it can also. Why are you scrolling on social media when you have a lack of sleep? Because your baby, why are you on social media? Shouldn't you be taking care of your baby? You almost get the sense that the nanny's taking care of the baby and Megan's scrolling through Instagram. That's like, that's not the experience most new moms have. And again, if you're a new mom and social media tends to overwhelm you, why shut it off again? You can delete the app from your phone for a period of time, especially if you're especially vulnerable. Again, why does the world have to change to conform to you? Instead, you need to make the decisions that work best for you. That's what I will always advocate. And yes, some people won't always like this channel and may unsubscribe. That is not my preference, obviously, but that is fine. You do what's best for you. I'm not going to force anybody to do anything or like anything I don't like. I'm just going to share with you my perspective on something. But Meghan Markle does want or seems to be advocating for that sort of level of control. Also be really dizzying for them to see this portrayal of motherhood that looks so perfect when we all know it's not perfect. We all know that it's messy. I'm fortunate in that, you know, amongst the. OK, so. It's messy. Oh, we don't know. We all know it's not true. Well, then, of course, then again, delete the app if it's bothering you that much. But also, we've never seen Meghan Markle be vulnerable in any sort of respect when it comes to her and her children. No, we've never even seen her with her children, for Pete's sakes. So again, this rings incredibly hollow. The privileges that I have in my life, I have an incredible partner. Um, my husband is such a hands-on dad and such a supporter of, of me and our family. And that I don't take for granted. That is a real blessing. Not to mention that they most likely have yard workers, housekeepers, nannies. They may even have a cook or chef that comes by from time to time. They have security. I mean, just the, she goes, oh, I have my husband. Now, I would believe that if she was a speaker at a, let's say, a conference on business or something. And this was a businesswoman and she was mid-tier in the spectrum. She's like, well, I have a great husband who helps me. Yes, Meghan Markle, we all know you probably have a team of people helping you and your husband. It's not just on you guys. Like this vision that she has is somehow it's all on her and her husband and that, oh, I just have this great partner and he does all of it. And like, no, you don't. You have somebody washing your dishes, somebody cleaning your laundry, somebody cleaning your house, somebody sterilizing the bathrooms. Like you have a whole team of people, I'm sure, helping you. And you and your husband probably are allowed and privileged to not have to do things normal families do or normal couples do because they don't have that level of support. So again, I find that completely demeaning to other women and sort of demeaning to her husband. Going, I have an amazing husband. We'll just call him here. My husband here, Harry, he is just so amazing and incredible. He's so good with our children or, you know, something to the effect of, we also have this amazing staff members who come. We have somebody who helps us clean, helps us keep our house in order, does the lawn, does the things that we can't do in a day. I would respect that because there are people right now. I mean, I'm sure there's a nanny watching their children at their home. Let's be honest. She ain't cleaning that 16,000 square foot mansion. She is not. So to act like they are is just silly. In my opinion, acknowledge the people who actually do help you acknowledge the little people. She, this is her chance to actually acknowledge the little people in her life. Not that they have any less value, but they are, let's say, don't have as big a profile. They probably don't get paid quite as much as she does. I mean, I know they don't. Why can't she acknowledge them in this moment, too? Because I'm sure they're the ones who are the bigger help in many ways. But a lot of people don't have that same level of support. So I think for us, it's just trying to put the safeguards in so that women and moms especially cannot feel like they're even more vulnerable when they go online, that they can somehow feel like they're going to a safer place. And Aaron, online is not safe. I remember reading a bunch of reports about how the, the horrendous things that are on Facebook. It's a, not a safe place. It's called the internet. 
It is the cesspool of human depravity is what it is. Be honest. You can't make it safe for moms. Moms have to make it safe for themselves. Take personal responsibility. That's what I feel like is so lacking here. Personal responsibility. Take your own personal responsibility here, Megan. But he talks about the statistics and what is happening to teenage girls in this country and traces it back to the advent of the smartphone in 2010 and the changes we've seen societally as a result of a smartphone, particularly for teenage girls, is so upsetting, disturbing and disheartening. Then don't let your daughter have a smartphone. Give her a different phone. There's actually a friend of my sister's husband and he has like an old fashioned phone It only does calls, does like bare calendar things, doesn't do anything else. If you need to make that choice for your kids, make that choice. Nowhere does it say in the world that you must give your child an iPhone and a tablet and an iPad of some sort. There's nowhere in the world where it says that. So you have the responsibility or the autonomy as a parent to make those choices. Nobody's saying you have to let your kids on Instagram. You know, and basically their business model is keeping people on the platform, especially Instagram and Facebook, because those are the platforms teenage girls are gravitating to. Okay, Katie Couric, teenage girls are on TikTok. They're not on Instagram and Facebook, Instagram and Facebook, Facebook, especially has skewed older. Instagram is following the same track. Katie Couric, it's, it's called TikTok now. It's it's all on TikTok. I, I should be on TikTok more. Honestly, I kind of hate talk, TikTok, so I'm not on it much. But technically, it's TikTok. And get as much data as possible so they can charge their advertisers certain rates and then ergo affecting the mental health, causing depression, particularly among teenage girls. So it's this vicious, not a virtual cycle. It's a vicious. And it, that is terrible. But also, a company needs to make money. It can't just not make money, guys. Again, the disconnect, you just feel the disconnect here. The cycle. And I actually brought some stats because I just was looking at this book and I thought, I'm just going to mention a couple of them because I think they're so relevant. Um, Did we catch, oh, hold on. And I actually brought some stats because I just was looking at this book and I thought, I'm just going to mention a couple of them because I think they're so Megan literally was trying to help her. Did you see that? <laughs> Megan's hand briefly went into frame and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is she doing? She's trying to apparently help Katie Kirk manage her thing. It's like Katie Kirk's a news anchor, Megan. I think she can, I think she can handle a microphone and a piece of paper. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, I was talking about it a little bit earlier, women, especially well, all people, you want to feel seen and you want to feel heard. But unless you're her sister-in-law, then she doesn't want you to be seen or heard. Again, community with Megan only goes so far and it doesn't go to her closest community, which is family. And community is a huge, vital piece of that because you, when, when you're part of a collective and you feel as if someone is seeing you, really seeing you, really listening to what you have to say, at a certain point you feel empowered when you don't feel alone. Well, which is so stupid because apparently she belittled her own female staff members, apparently, allegedly, whatever. And so... Again, what she's saying is just so incredibly hollow. She wants to be seen and heard. She wants her perspectives and opinions to be valued, but she doesn't want to value anybody else's. That's what that's telling you. Her valuing perspective only goes so far. We've heard this time and time again. They're difficult to work for. They're not collaborative. They want control. She is not somebody who creates community. She is somebody who divides a community, as we've seen with Harry's family. Any sort of fight or struggle, any experience, really, you want to have someone that you can share it with. And so I think the community building piece of that is key. And as we were talk touching on earlier, because there is so much work to be done, that is not a one man or one woman job. Yeah, it's not a one man or one woman job. But when it comes to Meghan Markle, she is a one woman show. Harry is the sidekick. She is a one woman show. The collective of all of us working together, understanding the shared goal that is in the interest, best interest of our shared humanity is just key. You can't, you can't do it by yourself. And I don't think you want to. Again, shared humanity. I just hate these kind of meaningless platitudes that she puts out there because it's just so not true. I think that's true, uh, Brooke. Uh At least I should specify when it, when it comes to her, it's not really true. She doesn't really want to build up community. She wants her own royal court that worships her. That's what she wants. Now, the question is, will the people who make the decision as streamers see the value of these shows that that focus on women or focus on older women? They will if they are successful. And I think Golden Girls proves that they can 100 percent be successful. But you have to have the right script, the right actors, the right crew, just because they're women, just because they're older, that should not be this thing that screams success. Again, good stories survive. Good stories are what drive things. Just because you include certain people in it or have a certain diversity quota in it doesn't make it good. Because people who watch these things, they do want to see, as Nancy said earlier, themselves reflected in the content that they're consuming. So yes and no. I want to be entertained. I don't really care if somebody's reflecting me at me. And there's not a lot of historians who do YouTube 
as a television show. That's that's not something that exists. So I'm perfectly fine. Like a historian doesn't even factor into many TV shows. I can't even think of it. Like the biggest industries they talk about are, let's say, um, journalism or family, like, you know, parents at home or, you you know, a couple other things. But here's the thing, too, is that Hollywood, again, they're a bubble. They think of two worlds, Los Angeles and New York. They don't really care much about what happens in the middle. And because of that, they're missing out on a lot of good stories because guess where basically every single television is based out of New York or Los Angeles. There's not a lot in between. Like Reba was one of the shows that was based out of Texas. It was based out of Houston. There was also Last Man Standing, which was based out of Denver. We had the Home Improvement, which was based out of Detroit. Let's see. Oh, Family Matters was based out of Chicago. Uh, we do have Full House was based out of San Francisco. That's a little bit more unusual. I think in the middle or something, I think one of the shows with Patricia Heaton that was based out of, I think, somewhere in the Midwest. I think Everybody Loves Raymond was based out of New Jersey, I think, or something like that. So there are those shows, but they really need to look at, there's a whole slew of people in the middle of the country. And yet a lot of Hollywood, they're talking about, oh, we need something that looks at everyone, but really they're talking about things that reflect their lives in Los Angeles and New York, not what is affecting everybody. Because actually, I think if they did more shows that encompass people who lived all over the country, I think they'd find even more success, to be honest. Connects perfectly to what you're saying, because to the point of having so many fantastic female creators and founders of production companies that are making such good work, I, I think Bella Bajaria is such a great example. She's at Netflix at the so this was interesting when Megan brought up Bella Bajaria, because she is the one who said that Harry and Megan, oh, they have a lot of projects. In very early development, i.e. they are spinning their wheels. So it's interesting that Megan's giving her a bit of props here. It's like you could almost offer as if she's trying to salvage what she can of Netflix. I don't know. Just again, putting that out there. Executive level of bringing in the content that reflects our stories in a holistic and real way. She's a woman, she's a woman of color, and that speaks to our earlier question about representation, right? She's in that role and in that role in a position of power, you were able to then share that more broadly so we can all feel more seen. Again, it has to be good content though. Doesn't matter if you're seen or not. If if every, let's say, if every show reflected Meghan Markle, a mixed race woman who married into the royal family, yes, that might be successful. But if it was Meghan Markle, the struggling actress, mixed race, like all those sorts of things that she was pre-suits and put that in the TV show, would that necessarily make it successful? No. Again, these people just don't seem to understand that regardless of their personal perspectives, it does matter whether or not a story is good. I can watch a story that has nothing to do with my life and enjoy the heck out of it because... I enjoy it. I like it. I think of a television show like Psych. I don't know a fake psychic. I don't know a ton of cops. I don't work with a police department. I don't have a black friend, best friend named Gus. And I don't have a Blueberry, which is the car they drive, which they call Blueberry because it's like this cheap little blue car. Like, I don't have any of those things, but can I still enjoy the show? I don't have a former cop dad who is just really, really hard on me. I don't have any of that. But do I enjoy the show? Yes, because it's funny. It's funny. Again, these people seem to think that diversity is a is interchangeable with entertainment. And it's not. It's just simply not. Since we've talked about Gloria Steinem a few times, I think she's such a fantastic example of why we all have to keep going. She's turning 90 next month or this month. And, you know, you look at Glow and at 90, she still knows there's work to be done and she's not throwing in the towel. And I think there's something so beautiful about that to go. But yet she cannot compliment her own grandmother-in-law, who is 96 and still working, by the way. She cares about Gloria Steinem but not about Queen Elizabeth II, or just doesn't appear to. She touts the success of Gloria Steinem. And yes, yeah, so yes, Harry and Meghan are trying, attempting to get away from the royal stuff. But their problem was not that they mentioned the royal stuff. It's how they did it, the negativity, the ugliness that they threw at the royal family. If they had talked generally about how great they all were, they could still talk about it. Their issue is what they did. Whether you're a nine-year-old girl or a 90-year-old woman, you can absolutely continue to make the change that we all need. And I, and I think it's a, it's a great, great reminder for all of us. Yes, again, you could mention Queen Elizabeth II as well, 96, or your own niece, Princess Charlotte. But no, no, because she doesn't care. Agreed. Well, listen, I cannot think of a better note to end on. Thank you, Erin. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Interesting, guys. That is it. Let's see. Let's watch for a second here, though. Is Harry the first person to stand up and give her like a, oh, you can't tell. Okay, guys, so that is it. I was just waiting to see if Prince Harry stood first to give her, you know, the glorious standing ovation because he must have been there to see her brilliance. And again, I call a foul a bit on him being there just because I find it super odd because they make such a fuss about their children all the time. And yet he can leave them for a couple of days with her for no other reason than to sit in the audience and clap at her brilliance. 
That is his whole purpose in being there. And yes, it's entirely possible their kids are there. But again, if they are flying out just for like 48 hours, I don't really think you would take your kids if you didn't have to. And when it comes to my own parents, my dad traveled a lot for work, especially when we were younger. And he definitely did not take my mom on every single trip with him, nor did she need to go to see a pretty, I would say, paltry little speech in front of a group of people that he could stream online at home. I'm sure it's he was perfectly capable of staying at home. And yes, there are instances where it's good, like the early years projects. When Catherine and first announcement was kind of officially launching, it made sense for William to be there. Does he have to be there every time she does something with early years? No. But Harry has to be there to support Megan. Why? Because Megan is desperate for the support and validation. So again, he must be there every single time. So guys, anyways, it was sort of interesting discussion. Really not. I think, again, to me, the echo chamber of Hollywood exists there. They These people really have no idea how the average person lives. And so it just does come across in some of their complaints about what's going on in the media. And yes, some is true. I'm all for diversity, but you need to make diversity and you need to make good stories. You can be diverse and make good stories. But if you are just being diverse for the sake of being diverse and you don't have a good story, it's going to suck. That's kind of how the world works. So anyways, guys, let me know what you think of this video. Thank you so much for watching and I shall see you soon. Bye.